In today's video, we're going to go through an introduction to sharp practice, the rules from Two Fat Lardies. This will be a step-by-step, -step, roughly speaking, introduction to the game, as well as a learning experience for myself, having not played these rules through in any great detail, although I have watched a number of videos and read a number of reports and reviews of the rule system. Um, so any mistakes made during the course of this will be mine only, um, although I will try to rectify them as far as possible when I notice them. So to start off with, you can see I've got all the things here on the table that you'll need for a game of sharp practice. Um, so the first things first is the rules, and here is the rule book itself. I've also taken the opportunity to print off a quick reference sheet from the internet that someone had kindly put together. And then from Two Fat Lardies, I've also purchased some of the various ancillaries that you'll need. So um, it's a card or chip activated uh, rule system. So the cards are in here, all the chips are here. I'll choose later on. Um, various markers that you'll need to indicate the status of troops or leaders during the game. Um, deployment markers, uh, a tape measure, although you could use a shorter ruler or paste stick of some kind marked off. And of course, some dice. Then, apart from which, I've set up the table in a fairly straightforward manner just for learning purposes. So apart from the rule book and the various accoutrements that you'll need to play the game, we'll of course need some miniatures as well. And you can see these in the background here, and you will have seen them on the channel before, being gradually built up over the previous weeks and months. So to play sharp practice, troops come in groups. These groups can be between 6 and 12 figures, and generally also need a leader. Um, on each side here today, for both the Americans there and for the British over here, I've picked five groups and then already roughly worked out some leaders to go with each of those groups. Um, so in terms of each of the groups having leaders, here there are two groups of uh, regular Continental Line Infantry and regular, in this case, donating the class and quality of troops, and you can get various different types of quality troops. Uh, but I won't go into huge detail at this stage about each of them. So two groups of regular line infantry there, and on the end they've got a status 2 leader, and you can have from statuses 1 to 4 in the form of the officer with the spontoon, and then behind him a, a corporal who's going to be a status 1 leader. Then another group here, these are going to be volunteer line infantry, and they've got a status 2 leader, the officer at the front there, then a group of skirmishers with a level 1 leader, and then a group of militia skirmishers with a level 1 leader, who's going to be the figure in the shirt sleeves at the front. Then for the British, so at the front here, we've got six uh, rifle-armed skirmishers, some Hessian Jaegers with a level 1 leader, six British light infantry, skirmishers with a level one leader, two groups of eight regular line infantry, and they've got a level three leader, because in comparison to the Americans, there's only one leader for the two groups there, as opposed to two. And then at the back there, some Queen's Rangers skirmishers uh, with a level one leader. In terms of rifle arm troops on both sides and weapon types, everybody's got muskets, apart from the Hessians who've got rifles. So there'll be no rifles on the American side. So that's it, that's the two forces for the game. Uh, so I'll go ahead and prepare the table and be right back. So I've cleared the table and we're back. The last thing to do before uh, starting off with the game is to point out that the Americans will have five leaders in the card deck and the British will have four. They'll also have four of these command cards each and then there's the tiffin card for the end of each turn. And these will be shuffled into the deck, and then they're drawn, and whatever comes out of the deck indicates who can do something next in the turn. And obviously with the tiffin card being in there at random, that will lead to variable turn lengths. And the cards also give you additional things that you can do with your leaders and affect the course of the turn. But as that comes up uh, and their cards are encountered, uh, we will cover that. The last thing to mention is that I'm going to play scenario one from the rulebook, which is called an encounter, um, which will mean that each side will have a single deployment point in one of the uh, table thirds, that side of the board or this side of the board. 
Um, I'm not going to use any force support just to keep things a bit more simple. And the objective is a reduction in force morale. Normally for both, I'm going to start with a force morale of 10. It's probably not going to get that far. I'm just going to play through a few turns to get a feel of the game, the mechanics, and how things work. So with that, I will take these things off the table and we will start turn one. The only last note actually is that the fences and trees will all be at a light cover. There are different forms of cover in this game, which you may be familiar with, along with a number of the mechanics from other two Fat Lardies games. Um, but these will count as what's called light cover in the rules. So that's it. I shall go ahead and ready the deployment points. So the deployment points have been placed. On the near side here, in the middle of the left-hand third of the table, is the American deployment point. And then over there, in the trees, in the centre of the far table edge, is the British deployment point. Now this is a relatively small table. Normally I would play on a 6x4, um, but I'm not doing that today. It's about 4 foot by 3 foot, just for the purposes of the game. Uh, so let's get started and draw some cards and see what happens. So as described, this is a card-activated, random turn-length game. So the first card that comes out is Blue Leader 2, which is for the Americans, so we will decide what to do with that card and then come back. Okay, so that is in fact the um, corporal on the American side, who is a subordinate leader in the uh, two groups of regular line infantry. So he can't do anything because he's got a more senior leader in that set of groups. So we'll go on to the next one. He's actually seen leader one, which is the um, officer commanding the two groups of uh, regular line infantry, the Continentals. So they're going to go ahead and deploy from their deployment zone. So this is the result of that command card. The two groups of Continental infantry, the 7th Pennsylvania, have deployed together in a formation onto the table with their uh, level 2 officer behind them to the left and a level 1 sergeant behind them to the right, ready to advance across this field. So we'll go ahead and draw the next command card, which is a red flag, which uh, we'll bank to one side for now. And then a blue flag, which we'll bank to one side. And then a red flag. Now, depending on the number of cards that you have in your hand, flag cards you have in your hand at any one time, you can interrupt the turn to do various different actions and activations with things on the table. The more cards you have, the more variety you have available to you. So for example, you can carry actions that require one card, or both of them, or three, or up to four, because there are only four of each in the deck. However, if during the dealing phase, um, three cards of either colour come out in order, it triggers a, a random event for whichever unit was last activated. So I will go ahead and check that table now to see if anything needs to happen to these guys. Having checked the rules, I'm going to go ahead and say that, also to get on with the game, that nothing's going to happen on this occasion. They either are moving random events or firing random events, and as the unit's deployed onto the table and it can't move, I'm going to go with the fact that, um, well, a, de a deployment is not the same as a movement in terms of an action they can take. So we'll go with nothing happens for now, but it means both sides have quite a few cards on the table, and we'll continue dealing. So that's another red command card. And another red command card. So they now have four on the table. And then the Tiffins. So that is the end of the turn. If you have cards on in your hand, or flag cards in your hand at the end of the turn, when a Tiffin card comes up, you can use them to do different extra things. So I will check if any of those apply, and then we will come back. So having checked the rules, I realised that actually all those flags, as I suspected might be the case, you can actually do something with during the turn. So I've rectified things, or the turn will still end, in that um, we used three of the flags to bring on these Hessian Jaegers, who have deployed 12 inches away, because they can, as uh, skirmishers, deploy 12 inches from the deployment zone uh, point, uh, and depending on the, the troop type is how far away you can deploy from your deployment point. So in this case, up to 12, light infantry up to 9, and the Americans who deployed earlier up to 6, or any line infantry up to 6. So they've deployed 12. 
Now, when you come on and you deploy, you can't also move, but you can do other things, including fire. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have the Hessian Jaegers fire at these Continental Infantry uh, close to this camera. Uh, I've already measured the range; they're within twenty-four inches. So, I shall go ahead and get the necessary dice, and then we shall do a round of firing. So the firing procedure is based on a series of range bands depending on the weapon being used. The maximum range for most weapons, so carbines and muskets, is 24 inches, but rifles have a range of 36. As it happens, the Jaegers are within 24 here, uh, which means that to hit they will need fives or sixes. Now you get one dice per firer, and so as there are six Jaegers, they will get six dice. However, because they, a command initiative is being used by the uh, officer that's with them, he's using his command initiative, so we add one dice per command initiative, which is just one there. Plus, I notice in the modifiers that command cards can also add a shot. And as it's the first time they're firing, we want to make it as effective as possible. So that fourth flag command card the British had, we're going to add another dice. So they'll get eight dice in total, uh, hitting on fives or sixes. Now there are modifiers for their ability to hit, so one of which is first fire. So it's their first round of fire in the whole game, so that's a plus one, so it will be on four or more. Um, it's not a controlled volley, it's not canister, they're not light infantry, they are skirmishes firing at over 12 inches, so that will be plus one to simulate skirmishes wanting to stay back from their opponents. Um, so they're on a three or more. So we'll go ahead and roll the dice on a three or more, uh, firing at the Continentals over here. So we shall roll the dice. So taking away anything below a three, the Hessians have scored five hits. And then you roll the dice again on a different chart for the effect of the hits. So in this case, uh, the columns are uh, in the open, light cover or heavy cover. The Americans are obstructed behind this uh, fence line here, so they'll class us in light cover. So uh, sixes uh, will cause a casualty, uh, four or five a point of shock, and one to three will do nothing. So we'll go ahead and roll that next to the Americans here. So of those five hits, a one to three is nothing. So in fact, from those eight shots, all that they've managed to achieve is a single point of shock. Now, if you're familiar again with Two Fat Lardy's games, you'll know that shock often features in their rule systems, and basically the accumulation of points of shock um, has a detrimental effect on the unit. So it impedes their ability to move, um, to shoot, uh, and, and things like that, essentially. It impedes their ability to continue uh, to function on the table. And the greater number of points of shock the worse the effect of that is, to the point where it will cause them to fall back and potentially rout. So I'll go ahead and add that point of shock, and then that will actually be the end of the turn, and we'll come back for the next turn. So this will be the beginning of the second turn. As a little update to the end of the first turn, just to pick up on any little omissions and mistakes, uh, the, the hits that were scored should have been split between these two groups, um, as you may have seen in other games like Chain of Command. Um, however, as there was only one point of shock, I've just allocated that to the right-hand group of eight. And in addition to which, uh, I've placed some smoke there in front of the Hessians. Uh, this is to signify the fact that uh, in this era of weapons, uh, although units get two things that they can do when they're activated, for example, fire and move and so on, um, they do have to reload. So if they fired, they are unloaded. And for example, the two actions they're given if they're activated, they would have to then reload before they could fire again, or reload and move, for example. Um, the different, only difference to that is that that is for muskets, which need one reload action. Rifles, such as these Hessian Jaegers have, require two. So they're going to have to spend a bit of time reloading, um, which is a trade-off for the extra range that they have. So we shall go ahead and begin this second turn and see what comes out of the deck. So red leader three. I will go ahead and deploy red leader three. So red leader three was the officer that you can see there, Coldstream Guards officer, and he has just deployed nine inches out with that group of six British light infantry who are moving 
to one side of the Jaegers to occupy that bit of the fence and give them some support. So we shall play the next card. The next card is the Tiffin, so that's another quite short turn. So we will shuffle those back into the deck uh, and then go on with the next turn. So after that very short turn, we'll go on to turn three with the first card. So the first card is a blue flag for the Americans, and then a red flag for the British. Probably going to be three flags, and it's three flags. There are three flags available, and the last unit to do something uh, were the Hessians who fired. In fact, no, they weren't. The last unit to do something were the light infantry who deployed. Um, but to be consistent with it earlier, they didn't move, so I'm not going to um, roll for a random event for them. So the next card is Red Leader 1, and that is the um, level 3 leader, the status 3 leader, in charge of the two groups of British regular line infantry. So off the back of that card, the British have deployed here their two groups of regular line infantry just coming out in a slightly unformed gaggle because they can't form into a line in that terrain with the officer leading them at the front. You will notice there's a sergeant figure on the left hand side. He's not acting as a leader in this. He's actually making up the group of eight because when I built them, I built two groups of eight and one of them was a sergeant figure. So I'll add a separate figure at a later date. So they've come out and they're emerging from the woods there uh, towards the road. So we'll go ahead and draw another flag. I mean, not flag, well, maybe a flag. Uh, so leader one. So that is the continental officer in charge of this group. So we shall decide what they're going to do and then come back. To get the most out of their muskets, the Americans need to get a bit closer, and also it'll showcase some movement rules. So they're gonna move straight ahead in their formation, try and cross this fence. Uh, to do that, they've been activated using one command initiative uh, by their officer. That gives them two actions they can take, and they're gonna use them both for movement, and each of those actions gives them uh, a single D6 worth of movement. Now to cross an obstacle like this, uh, they will discard the lowest dice of the two, uh, and any movement left, they'll either enable them to clear the obstacle or it won't. If they can't clear it, they stay on the near side. We'll have to try again in the next turn. So we shall roll. And so they get a five and a three. So we remove the three, which gives them five inches of movement, which I think is going to be enough for them to clear the fence directly to their front. Now, if they were less able troops, they would also take shock um, as they cross the fence uh, as a form of disruption. If it was a minor obstacle, if it's a major obstacle, which I will classify these as because they're quite large fences, then that happens to a much greater degree depending on your troop quality uh, and, will, and would also break their formation. But because they are regular line infantry, it's not going to break their formation and they're not going to take any shock, but it is going to slow them down as they clamber over the fence. So I'll go ahead and do that. So seemingly undaunted by the rifle fire to their front, the Americans have come on and crossed the fence. Perhaps they can't see the large number of red coats behind because of the smoke. And that is uh, one of their level two leaders, uh, two command initiatives that he has for being a level two leader. The command initiatives correspond uh, to their level or status. And then with the other one, he's going to use it to uh, do a non-activating action, which is to remove this point of shock from one of the two groups. And with that, we'll then go ahead and draw the next card which is the Tiffin again. Uh, and so that would be the end of the turn. However, um, there are cards left. So I will decide what is possible with these cards and then we shall return to see what happens. So having consulted the rules, uh, at, the end of the at the end of the turn, you can use individual uh, flags, command cards, um, to activate a single group or formation that has not yet been activated. Well, the Americans cannot use their card because the only formation they've got on the table has moved. Uh, the British have got two uh, cards here left. Now, the only thing they've done in their turn was bring on leader one, which is the big group, which means that the Hessians, the light infantry already present, uh, have not yet done anything. So we're gonna give them one card each. So the activation for the Hessians will give them two actions. Uh, it takes two actions to reload, so that will cause them to be reloaded and I'll remove the smoke which is indicating they're unloaded and then the other one will be used for light infantry and they will roll a couple of dice with their two movement actions to move up and line the fence next to the Hessians. 
So I shall go ahead and do that, and then we'll come back for the next turn. So here we are at the beginning of the next turn, and I carried out the actions that were available from the flags at the end of the last one, and we're going to go ahead with the next turn. We're going to go ahead a bit quicker through this, uh, and it might be that if nothing inspiring happens to the turn, I will play on until something of rules relevance that's worth explaining happens. But let's uh, try another turn and see what happens. Brilliant. So Tiffin on card one. That actually means that the chapter ends uh, in game terms and has certain effects. So I'm going to have to check what that means and then come straight back. Okay, so when the chapter ends, because the Tiffin card comes out first, everybody would be reloaded, ammunition would be resupplied, uh, troops would get water, things like that. Broken troops would be removed, buildings would collapse, leaders would recover, and deployment points would be captured. However, none of those things are possible. So essentially it just ends the turn on that first turn of the card. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, put it back into the deck, and then we shall continue playing on. Uh, so the next card out is Red Leader 1, which is the big group of British at the back. So they're going to uh, dice for movement. Uh, what I'll do is I'll continue from here and I'll get some cards out and if uh, something like firing takes place we'll go through the firing action again because it's probably more interesting. So I'll be right back when there's something of note to report. So we break net live now as the turn has moved on to bring you the current situation and it's not looking good for the Americans. The cards have not been kind to them. The uh, big British group of regular line infantry all moved three inches towards the road which wasn't particularly interesting. Then the last British group of Queen's Rangers skirmishes with muskets came on and deployed behind that fence. Um, and the British have got a series of flags which they've kept ready to interrupt so they can still fire into the American uh, uh, Pennsylvanians. Uh, and now leader three cards come out. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the British light infantry behind the fence over there are going to fire into the uh, Continentals. Um, shortly thereafter, if an American card comes up, um, they could get interrupted using these flags to activate the Hessians to also fire into them. So they're not in a particularly good position, but we'll go ahead uh, in the first instance uh, and do this firing. So there are, behind those trees over there, six are British light infantry. Uh, they're having their fire directed by... Actually, no, they can't. It's a level one leader. That is a mistake I made earlier. He's already used the command initiative to activate them to fire. If he had a spare command initiative, he could add it to them. So actually, maybe the Hessians deservedly scored not many hits earlier. What we will do is we'll use one of the British flags uh, to add a uh, additional dice uh, to the dice pool. So we will go ahead and roll for that. Uh, so the Americans find themselves within 12 inches. So for muskets, that's going to be a 4, 5, or a 6 to hit. Uh, it is the first shot of the battle, so it's going to be a 3 three or more. And they are light infantry, so they get a 2 or more. So it's going to be the classic anything but 1s on 7 dice against these Continentals. And that is a lot of <laughs> Four ones, terrible. But they do score three hits. Now, as the Americans are in the open, it's different this from last time uh, because they've got no fence line, no light cover to protect them. Um, so as they're in the open, uh, a one or a two will be nothing, a three to five will be shock, uh, and a six will be a casualty. Uh, so we're all for, we we'll split them up. So one on the right hand group, two on the left hand group, like that, as the left hand group's closer to them, I suppose. So it might take more hits. So the left hand group. So the left hand group takes a point of shock. And then the right hand group also takes a point of shock. So we'll go ahead and mark those. Not too bad, actually. Uh, and then we will go on uh, to the next card. So that's the shock marked. Uh, and then we will continue on to the next card. Ah, the only thing is, there's no smoke placed in front of them because when activated, they have two actions. And so the first one they've fired, and then with the second one, they've reloaded. So there's no need to place smoke to indicate that they are still unloaded. So we shall draw the next card, which is a blue flag, which will go over there. Americans can't do anything with that. 
Uh, the British aren't going to interrupt yet. They want to see what the next card that comes out of the deck is. And this one is uh, Blue Leader 5, which is actually the Militia Skirmishers. So some much needed reinforcements for the Americans. So the Americans Militia Skirmishers, who are classified as Irregular Skirmishers in this, have deployed here, behind the fence, just behind the left of the advancing Continentals, and able to see across the field. Um, because they're regular skirmishers, they get a bonus for shooting over the range of 12 inches, but only if they're in cover, um, to reflect their different nature to other kinds of troops, and they're sort of more having more comfort at harassing the enemy from cover. So they're going to fire from behind that fence at the light infantry over there. The British aren't going to interrupt because... Uh, there's, there's not a threat to a group that's already fired because the Hessians haven't fired yet. So the militia will fire across the field there uh, at the British Light Infantry. So here we are, the militia are going to fire. Now there are six militia, so they're going to have six dice. And the Americans are also going to burn a flag because they feel like they might run out of flags before the tiffin gets drawn and they'll have used all the units on the table to add another dice. So now we have seven dice. Now they're firing at uh, long range for their muskets, which would need sixes. Uh, but it's their first fire, so that's plus one, so fives. And they are irregular skirmishers in cover greater than uh, 12 inches from the enemy. So it'll be fours. So we should go ahead and roll seven dice, hitting on fours against the light infantry over there. Uh, so three hits. Uh, now the light infantry are in a light cover, uh, so one to three will have no effect. So we've actually got the first casualty of the battle potentially. So they take one point of shock uh, and they will take a casualty. Now when you suffer casualties in this game and <clears throat> with a similar process in other uh, Fat Lardy's games, including Chain of Command, which we've seen on the channel presumably, uh, a casualty also poses a threat to the leader. Now in this, you only ever score casualties on sixes. In addition to which, if the firing is done by a formed group such as this, um, the risk to the leader is such that you have to roll under the number of casualties suffered, uh, and it has to be under. So if they inflict one casualty, they cannot pose a threat to a leader. However, if it's fired by skirmishers or regular troops such as these, it can be equal to or less than the number of casualties uh, to reflect their potential for picking off an NCO or an officer. So in this case, there is a potential threat uh, to the leader involved in this. So we shall go ahead and place that point of shock and then we shall roll to see what happens. So having placed that point of shock, we're now gonna roll uh, dice. And if it's uh, a one, then the Coldstream Guard Sergeant commanding those light infantrymen will have been hit instead of one of the infantrymen. And it's now it's a six. So he is safe. However, if we remove that tree, we shall remove a light infantryman who has been hit by the militia fire. And it's actually first blood to the Americans, despite the amount of shooting um, that has been directed towards the Continental Line infantry. And then with that, we shall go on to the next card. So it's Red Leader 2, which is the Hessians. Which is convenient, because we have to use the flags. So now we're going to do some more shooting, which is the most exciting part, let's face it. And I'll choose the blue dice, although I should probably use this for the Americans, as they've got blue flags. And so the Hessians will have uh, six dice. They've been activated by a level one leader uh, six dice, and now that we've moved most of the things on the table, I think the British are going to sacrifice a command card for an extra shot, I think. So they'll burn a flag and add an extra dice. So they shall have seven shots, and they're going to fire their rifles uh, at the continents in front of them, who are at 12 inch range. So they're hitting on fours, fives, and sixes. Uh, it's no longer their first fire, but they are skirmishers. However, because they're skirmishers within 12, they don't get a bonus for firing anymore, which is a uh, sort of counterintuitive trade-off, but there you go. I suppose if they were if they were further away, they'd still be hitting on fours. So, so hitting on fours. So a pretty good roll, much better than the light infantry. 
So they've got five hits, and the Americans are in the open, so quite vulnerable here. But still no casualties. Uh, I forgot to split the uh, hits across the two groups, uh, but we'll allocate them rationally. So they take three points of shock, um, which be split across those two groups. So we'll go ahead and place those. And so they're taking a lot of shots, but despite the pretty close range, some pretty rotten shooting um, from the British and Hessians op opposing them. So having done that, the only mechanic we haven't seen of significant note now is the uh, morale decrease, uh, which comes about by uh, losing groups, having them retreat, break, or be wiped out, or something happen to your leaders. So, for example, had the uh, officer commander goes light infantry been hit, um, whether he'd been uh, wounded or killed, which you would dice for, would then have uh, an effect on the force morale, uh, which is again randomly generated by a separate table, and the number of uh, points are indicated by the table are removed from the force morale, and that would get you down towards, or in the case of this scenario, with your target, which is to reduce the enemy's force morale to three or lower than that, whilst keeping your own above that. And that's the only significant mechanic we haven't seen yet. Pretty much everything else has happened. Uh, so I'm just gonna play ahead a few more flips of the cards uh, to see what happens, and then we'll come back. So having flipped the cards on a little bit further, the Americans have had further reinforcements in the form of this group of additional volunteer line infantry from Hartley's Continental Regiment, and they also had more flags come out, although they weren't three in a row. Uh, so with the fact that there are only a few cards left in the deck in mind, and that chances are everything else will either come on by itself or is already activated, um, Leader 2 has just come out of the deck. Now that is the corporal attached uh, to this formation of infantry here. So what we're going to do is activate him. Now he's got one CI, which uh, because the group's under command of somebody else, he can use to take a point of shock off, which would be helpful to take this excess shock off. However, I believe that you can use these cards um, to increase his command initiative, and I wish to do that only so that he can remove more points of shock. And there may be a limit on this, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, give him those three cards and burn them all to allow him to uh, obviously offer quite a lot of encouragement uh, to the formation and remove a further three points of shock, uh, which would seem a worthwhile use of the flags, given they can't do much else at this stage. And then they will hopefully be able to do something effective in the next turn. So that is another example of mechanic you can use the flags for. So we'll just quickly flip the remainder over. So blue leader four is actually the remaining Americans, which is their um, skirmishers. So I shall bring those on uh, and then finish the turn. So I played the game out to the end of the turn. Uh, actually, the Tiffin was the very last card out in this turn. We used the whole deck. Uh, and the Americans' remaining uh, skirmishers came on. Um, I had a little flick through the uh, troop types and things. I'm not using any specific uh, listed versions from the rulebook. I've given them characteristics that are just useful for me to use for the purposes of this learning game. Because, for example, I'm classing these as uh, regular uh, continental line troops or state line troops, depending on which you prefer to call them. Um, but in the uh, rulebook, they're classified as conscripts and volunteers, which is what I'm putting on this unit just to give them you know, a bit of variety for rule sports on the table. Um, and so that is the end of the turn. So I hope that's given some kind of uh, rough outline of how some of the mechanics work. I apologise, it was a little bit uh, start and stop, but hopefully it gives you the feel of sort of learning and exploring the rule set and having a roll of the dice. Uh, in the same way that I've essentially been doing myself. As I said at the beginning, I make no pretensions towards being an expert on the rules and I've been learning as I've been going along, uh, although I do have some understanding of them, so as to enable this uh, video to flow a little bit better than it otherwise would do. So uh, for now, I'm going to uh, play a few more turns just for my own enjoyment uh, and I'll 
come back and give my uh, final thoughts on the game later. So that was the end of another turn in which actually almost all the cards came out of the deck and you can see uh, things have happened. Uh, so down here, uh, this group of Continentals tried to swing out to the right. The uh, skirmish in front of them moved up and fired into the Hessians uh, and inflicted some uh, shock. The Hessians then uh, fired into the uh, Continentals here and I think only inflicted a point of shock again, very disappointing. Um, however, more successful were the light infantry over there, who fired into the uh, Pennsylvanians and inflicted a point of shock and two casualties, one of which turned out to be on the officer commanding them, who has lost a command initiative. He was then promptly given a flag, which uh, enabled him to remove a point of shock, and also he's ordered the Pennsylvanians to present so that they can fire a controlled volley at the next opportunity. Uh, these militia skirmishers did not activate. The level three leader over here used all three of his command initiatives, two to move the two different groups of regulars, and then a third to snap them into position, and they got decent move rolls. And they now formed up rather menacingly on this uh, road line, uh, ready to control this open ground. And the Queen's Rangers just moved up to support their flank. I mean, in terms of the game situation, it's probably reaching its pivotal moment. The Americans are in a difficult position because just because of the way the terrain turned out when I threw it down, they've found themselves largely in the open. Um, but it's reached a pivotal moment, so I shall see if anything of great note happens in the next turn. So in the first few card pulls of the next turn, first of all, we had a red flag come up, but then we had leader one get drawn, which is good for the Americans as leader one is here and the Continentals are already presented. So they're going to fire a control volley now to their front, which they can only do on their first volley, but they can do it. So they're going to roll a total of 15 dice, and they're going to fire hitting on threes because it's a control volley against the Hessians and light infantry to their front. So 15 dice hitting on threes. So only three misses, which is pretty good. Um, so it's going to be split before I forget. Five, five, six, so six on each. Um, both the Hessians and the light infantry are in light cover. So six is will cause casualty, four, five shock, one to three is nothing. So first of all, on the Hessians. So that's one casualty and fours and fives are shock. So a very effective volley against the Hessians. And then against the light infantry. Similarly effective, it seems. So the Hessians suffered four points of shock to add to the one that they've already got, which is quite a lot. And then the light infantry took two. In addition, they've both taken a casualty, but they also both have leaders. So we will dice to see whether or not they suffer a casualty respectively. So the Hessians are fine. And the light infantry are also fine, sixes and sixes. So each just suffer a casualty. So we'll remove a light infantryman and remove a Jaeger from the fray. So the Jaegers now have three, four, five points of shock uh, and six men. So they're not in particularly good shape, but a, a very effective volley uh, from the Americans who then with their second action will reload and be ready for the next round of firing. So that shows you how effective a control volley will be. However, um, unlike the British regulars who can continue firing them, only the first volley fired by the Americans is controlled and everything after will be uncontrolled, um, which is not unrealistic that <clears throat> the better training of the troops, the more likely it is you can keep them under control, but even better troops in reality would 
probably eventually dissolve into disorganised fire by files. Anyway, we shall move on uh, and see what else takes place with Blue Leader 4, and we're back if there's any more significant action. So in reading the rules, I've just picked up on uh, an error or two that I've made in the course of this, which someone may well have commented on already, which is that light infantry and skirmishers count as being in one level of cover better than they actually are, and also light infantry ignore the first casualty result in any one round of firing. So to try and rectify that, the light infantry over here have had one of their casualties replaced, and have halved their shock, uh, and the Hessians here have still got the only casualty they've suffered, but I've taken off two points of shock, as that seemed relatively fair, because the American volley w was pretty effective. Um, all that's happened apart from that is that uh, the Hessians over here um, bickered away at long range at these guys and inflicted three points of shock, and these American skirmishers fell back, reloaded, fired, uh, and managed to pick uh, off one of the British regulars and inflict a point of shock. However, the British regulars, uh, at the end of this turn on the Tiffin card, are being activated um, with a flag, and they're going to fire a uh, controlled volley in the direction of these skirmishers and state troops. So we're going to go ahead with that and roll these 15 dice. They're within 12 inches uh, of these guys, so that's a 4, 5, and a 6. It's their first fire, and it's controlled volley, so they'll be hitting on twos. So pretty effective, hopefully. Uh, so only one miss. So that is seven on each. So seven in what is actually light cover as their skirmishes, first of all. Um, not a very good roll at all. That is just two points of shock on the front group of skirmishers. So we shall place that on them. And then the rest of the hits go through onto the group behind who are still in range. Because they're further away, they actually count as being in one level of cover better than they are. So they're also in light cover, even if they're not light infantry or skirmishers. And in this case, they suffer a casualty. And four points of shock, which is pretty effective. Shall roll to see if it is their leader. Oh no, we can't. It doesn't. It won't do it. It was a one actually, but because they're line troops, that does not count as casualty. If they were skirmishers, light infantry, that would be a hit on the leader, but it cannot be. So they lose one guy, and I'll take four more points of shock. which is up to a total of seven. Could consolidate this into one marker with a dice next to it, but I've got enough tokens for now. So they've now got seven points of shock, and there are only eight of them, any more than that, and they might fall back off the table. Um, but that is a present and fire from those British regulars. So no casualties caused on the leading skirmishers, one and three points of shock there. Um, however, they are now also unloaded, so I'll mark them with smoke. Uh, and then there's one card left per side, so we'll go ahead and do something with that. And that's where I'm going to call it into the game. With the remaining flags, the Americans just took two points of shock off these uh, state troops here. And then the British used their remaining flag to have the light infantry, now that I know their rules a bit better as well for shooting, fire into these... Uh, Pennsylvanians and they successfully managed to pick off another one of those uh, and that's it I'm going to call this learning and training game here at that stage um, um, you know, I, I think these rules are actually quite easy and fairly intuitive to pick up I like the way the system flows I like the way there are just not too many complicated rules just to reward for example the way that light troops or skirmishes operate in cover you might prefer to shoot at longer range and harass people um, yeah it was enjoyable to pick up and, and fairly straightforward and quick to do so uh, as a game system. I like the the unpredictability of the card-driven system. keeps both players engaged, keeps some uncertainty, keeps you flexible in terms of how you plan and what you decide you're going to do. Um, so yeah, I think a, an, another proper game coming up soon that um, I'll get the full table out for and record as a proper a game report. 
uh, using all the figures available, and we'll name the characters and so on and so forth. I think that would be that'd be very enjoyable. In terms of the specific outcome in this game, obviously I haven't played it to a conclusion. Um, I did roll when the uh, Pennsylvanian officer was wounded and that did knock one off their force morale. So maybe that's a, a, a minor victory for the British, who do hold a strong position along the fence normally. So perhaps the Americans uh, withdraw into the smoke under the cover of their skirmisher units and militia that are knocking around the place. Uh, yeah. Very enjoyable. Not a huge number of casualties on either side either. Uh, a couple off the Pennsylvania Regiment, a Hessian, a light infantryman, a British regular, and uh, one from Hartley's Continentals. But yeah, th thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed watching it and, and following along. Uh, if this is your first look into Sharp Practice 2, um, I apologise, although that it's not uh, a more formal review or introduction or tutorial, but it wasn't really designed with that in mind. It was just to get a sense of the game as I get a sense of the game, really. Um, so yeah, I hope, you've, I hope you've enjoyed it, whether you're a veteran of the rule set or not. And uh, I'll look forward to putting up another one of these games in full on the channel in the near future, hopefully. So with that, I will leave it here and happy hobbying in the meantime.